Hi, this is Jack Tester, and welcome to another edition of Leadership Lounge. I am in Seattle. I've stepped out of our meeting here. We have a, a leadership spotlight going on, and I'm sitting across the table from Joe Navarro. How you doing, Joe? I'm well. Good to be here with you, Jack. Yeah, we've got you coming in here to talk to us tomorrow, and uh, we picked you as, to, as a speaker for us because of your expertise in nonverbal communication. In fact, uh, for 25 years, I want to talk about you so people know why you're talking to me. All right. Is that uh, you were an FBI agent specializing in behavioral assessment. Mm. Is that right? That's correct. And did you even, I've even heard the term used that you were kind of a spy catcher. <laughs> Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, most of my career in the FBI, I was assigned to do work in the National Security Division, which was uh, primarily, because the bureau's divided into the criminal side and the national security side, which is counterintelligence. So primarily my work was uh, working counterintelligence as a spy catcher. So our targets were, um, at the time, the Soviet Union, later Russia, um, East Germany, um, all the uh, bloc countries, Cuba, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, that kept us busy even after the wall came down. So that was primarily the, the work that I did. And then on the behavioral side, um, for whatever the reason, I was one of uh, six agents selected out of 12,000 to uh, head up the, uh, the National Security Behavioral Program. And uh, Sounds, I, I got kind of a weird feeling when you said that. It sounded, what does that mean? Well, that's what everybody asks, even in the bureau. Uh, I got a little frightened when you <laughs> said <laughs> Well, the, th the thing is, in counterintelligence, uh, because the work that spies do is so subtle, it's not overt. It's not like a bank robber that right. goes in and, and, you know, drives up in a car, and there's a getaway car, uh -huh. and there's a weapon. Espionage is about influence. It's about recruiting people and so forth. And so... Our job was to, my job in particular, because of my expertise with nonverbals, was to look at the behavior and say, is this guy, let's say he's assigned to the United Nations, is he up to no good? By is, watching him? By observing him? You'd, you'd partially By that? watching, because the Bureau only has so many resources, and when you have X amount of individuals stationed here, we have to be selective. Who are we going to target so that we'll put surveillance on them or um, determine what they're up to? Okay. And we based a lot of that on their background, their training, uh, but but some of it with the uh, with their body language, yes. No kidding. Well, let's, I'm going to yeah. come back to that because mm -hmm. that was an interesting step off point. And just so people also know, you've written some books as well. Uh, Three Minutes to Doomsday, which is uh, for a potential movie, as I understand it, one of the six best business books, according to Wall Street Journal, the year it was released. Is that right? So, well, thanks for bringing that up. So Three Minutes to Doomsday was a, about a real espionage case. It was the, um, the most damaging uh, espionage case in American history because it dealt oh. with the the stealing of our nuclear go codes and we have never had that happen um, before or then and um, and yeah so i wrote the book george clooney bought the rights to it and then the other book louder than words is the one is the business book and right so mixed up. um i had been invited to harvard university um for i guess the last 10 years brian hall um was uh, there at Harvard. He was fascinated with nonverbals. Uh, and um, and uh, l listened to, to me uh, lecture. And he said, you know, you really ought to put these things down, but oriented towards business. And so I wrote um, Louder Than Words, uh, which is now in uh, 19 languages and um, it's I ironic forget. for a nonverbal book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it delves. That one dealt more with the best practices. Okay. 
which is, you know, when we talk about nonverbals, it's everything that communicates but is not a word. So why does a, why does a gas station that has brighter lights but higher prices attract more people than a place okay. that has lower prices but uh, uh -huh. is not as well lit? And uh, so it, it, it really talks about uh, Got it. The, the, the kinds of yeah. things that uh, would, would be interesting to, to a business. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 the one that's the best seller is um, what everybody is saying. And that one is in 29 languages. Okay. And, um, and I think I just heard the other day that um, it's in its 21st printing or wow, something. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's go. Let's come, we'll come back to some of this because I, I want to understand how you got to where you got. I want to, you know, where did, it, where did you start to get interested in, in this whole study? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's. Uh, I'm glad you've asked that because uh, for me, the, the, that is the story, is how I, I got to this because this was all unintentional. I mean, it really, it really was. I never, I never sought to write. I never saw myself as somebody that was uh, would be out lecturing, um, and. You know, now I'm I'm averaging about 40 events uh, uh, per year, and I think part of it has to do with, you know, we all have th th that story that begins um, e either in our youth or it begins. Uh, for me, I was born in Cuba. I, I came to the United States as a uh, a refugee during uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, wow. Okay. So I came here, uh, I didn't speak English, I was uh, uh, eight years old, and, and so for me, it, there was just something about uh, being able to look at people, and I was more reliant on their body language ah. as a non-speaker, okay. non-English speaker. And my mother always said I was, I was sensitive to that, but... But you know, I mean, I, you know, you, you quickly become Americanized. I yeah, mean, I, there's I, a lot of people <laughs> who were born in another country that don't do what you do, right? <laughs> no, that come to America, right? Yeah, no, and I didn't, and I wasn't going to be a body language expert. I I was playing football. I was playing basketball. I was having a great time. I, um, you know, but this sort of uh, this sort of stayed with me. And, uh, and certainly over the years, once I got uh, to the university, there was just something about it that as I met people and so forth, I, I could sort of intuit what, uh, what was on their minds. And uh, not in a mystical way, but yeah. just, uh, you know, they're having a good time or, or, or they're not. But the thing that, um, that really kicked it off for me was once I was in the FBI, it was such a revelation because you know you have this imagery of what you see on television and and you re realize that um, number one there's it's mostly paperwork but number two is really you're a paid observer you are you are being paid to observe and the best agents bar none were the ones that were very clever at observing. They could they could look at a street scene and they could tell you, okay, those guys are casing that bank. And they just had this ability to pick up on the nuances and you, and you know and you'd ask them, well, how do you how do you know that? This isn't something you trained. Is it just something they, these guys picked they up? They just they just picked up and you say because they're whispering to each other and okay. they're in the middle of the street. Why would you whisper to somebody? Uh, on a on a on so a street corner. What's, what's in that case? You're looking for something that's out of place. Is that just something that's that's different okay. or or, uh, or odd? Um, and then I just began on my own to, uh, to to study it. You know, before we got started, you asked me how how to how did all this begin? And I, and I I have to tell you, I think it began the day I graduated from college. I remember that that day. I headed, uh, I headed to the, um, to the public uh, library in Provo, Utah, 
and I went and got me a, um, a, a, a card so that I could check out books, and I told myself, now I'm going to read what I want to read. Oh, really? And uh, uh, I think that's, that's really what began my, my education because I had studied uh, criminology, and later I uh, studied international relations for my master's. But what I really wanted to study was anthropology and the, the kind of the subjects in psychology that I enjoyed. And, um, and I, I do a lot of Skype sessions now with uh, high schoolers and, and, and even younger all over the world, Korea, yeah. Europe. And, uh, and I tell them, you know, you, you will have to read those things that are required of you. But boy, the day you have the freedom to go and pick whatever book you want, cherish that. Okay. Because uh, so, I what did, did you pick? Anthropology. So, you picked anthropology. So, so the first one I went out um, and and got um, was a book by uh, Malinowski, where he was talking about the Trobriand Islands in the Pacific. And here's a guy who... Well, who hasn't read that? Well, yeah, yeah who right? hasn't who, read that? Who hasn't? But, here's, but, here's the, but here's the thing is it, it was one of the few books that hadn't been checked out. So I just start looking at it. And here's a guy who accidentally gets trapped in the Pacific Islands during the First World War. And he begins to write about what he sees on these islands, the rituals, the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how children are, are brought up. And that just began to broaden my, uh, my experiences. And you say, well, you know, it, w- w- what's the utility of that? And, and I have to tell you, it just frees you up to, the, to then see things. I had a, 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 a spy case years later And um, I made the case because I had made one observation while I was in Eastern Europe. And while I'm watching this guy um, here in in the United States, he leaves a a flower shop, uh, and it was just an accident that it was on um, Valentine's Day. And as he's leaving, he is carrying the bouquet of flowers, not like Americans do, but as East Europeans carry them, which is the bouquet is down so that the water flows from the stalk towards okay. the flowers. And I had only seen that in Eastern Europe. And so when I confronted him, I did a presumptive, what we call a presumptive. I didn't ask him if he was a, a spire or not. I just sat him down and I said, do you want to know how I know? And I said, it was the flowers, how you carried the flowers. And he just closed his eyes and, and he, it's like, okay, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then he, and then he came to work f- uh, for us. Yeah. So he was sent here as an illegal, like that show, The Americans. Uh-huh. He was sent here as what we call a, a, an intelligence illegal to hide in America and not do anything until hostilities break out. I, I always thought that was hokum. No, no, it's not. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, they have, uh, they have uh, uh, explosive uh, satchels buried uh, in different places. And um, you, you have to remember the uh, Who especially. Has explosive uh, satchels buried. Is, what's that? Who has explosive satchels buried? The, this is back in the day? No, uh, I can't say too much. Okay. You have to remember, especially with Russia. No one listens to this. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you got to remember, like with Russia, their thing was that if hostilities broke out, they needed redundancy. They needed to be able to um, take care of things in the United States. Um, and so they would send people over and become Americanized, and if hostilities broke out, they then uh, were to retrieve these satchels and blow up uh, trains that would be shipping. For instance, there's only one train line that goes to Homestead Air Force Base. Anything dealing with South America, 
that would have to be taken out and um it, it, you really? don't you, oh yeah it's, it's yeah this isn't hokum this is um yeah this is serious stuff and so the their uh, role was to lay low so they said so they so they send people over and says this guy so i get the yeah. picture right and he was just living in a life well, right. he's he has a job. He's yeah. uh, nothing, uh, uh, you know, nothing unusual, um, and uh, really good cover. He had lived in Canada before, and uh, the um, but his thing was that once a year he had to do what's called a sign of life check. And, I can't uh, believe this. It's like <laughs> a movie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sign of life. I'm up in the but, plumbing industry, but go right. ahead. But yeah, but so uh, that, that's like he, he, that means he comes up and says, "I'm still yeah. out here hidden." Well, but he, you know, here's the thing: is you know, you talk about the plumbing industry as um, th there were some that were directed to um, get involved in the construction business because then they could target uh, the infrastructure of uh, of certain buildings under construction. Huh. Yeah. Jeez, I can't believe it. <laughs> so should okay. I start interviewing you, Jack? <laughs> I, feel like, I swear, this whole week we've had people of influence, we've had this mentalist, now I got to, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm exposed. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I really uh, feel inadequate with you guys. But that's fascinating. Yeah. So, so you, you just, you, this is your, your power of observation. So you've been reading books about... Uh, yeah. different cultures and you and you observe some things and how people lived in Eastern Europe and then you saw yeah. this guy yeah. acting Eastern European <laughs> in the streets of wherever you were yeah. right so but it goes to show you that we 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 sometimes think we're planning our own trajectory and and we're not I I think the greatest attribute I had and I share this with students is that I was open to whatever came my way. I wasn't set okay. in, be, I remember working with some agents that said, oh no, I just wanna work criminal matters, I just wanna work bank robberies, and I, I worked whatever was, was offered to me, and I studied and read whatever was, was open to me, um, because I was, just, uh, I was just curious, and, and I, I assure you, at no time in, in my early career working counterintelligence that I think I would be lecturing all over the world or, yeah. or, or writing books. I, I, I think for all of us, in, in whatever profession we have, I, I, I think one of the great things that we, we learned from the Renaissance period was how curiosity um, tends to reward us. It tends to reward us immediately, but it tends to reward us in the future. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci was, was looking at mechanical devices one day. He's the first one to discover what, what arterial, or, uh, arterial sclerosis is, and the next day he has literally a note asking, what happens to the tongue of the uh, of uh, of the bird, the uh, the woodpecker, uh, when it's retrieved, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. here's this wonderful right. cu curiosity, this ability to observe, and as it turns out, it, it's it, it goes up and, and protects the brain during the impact. But, but, but here was a guy. Sorry. I didn't know where this would go. But this is great. No one yeah, knew. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, it's proof of it, Joe. No one knew. But, but that's that's the kind of thing that uh, that that fascinated me. And uh, and and look, you know, look at your own organization. Look at the speakers you've yeah. you, you've had. Jack, you can't tell me that you're not a curious person. Just the questions that, that you've, you've asked your, your, your speakers and, yeah. and, and, and other guests, it, this is both uh, a learning experience, but it's also a growing experience. And, and I, I think we, we just all do well when, when we can uh, yeah. lend ourselves to that. Yeah, so, so the, the, the thread we were going on there is kind of how you you know, kind of got from being a college student to, to, to 
being in the FBI, right, and then having some interest, and yeah. and so did 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 you start to focus on this nonverbal? Does that or is this just yeah. something that you did in addition to other things? And and you know, and I guess what I'm interested in is is yeah. how did you become why an expert in this? Because you are a curious guy. You read books about some island. I can't remember what it was, yeah. right? And, right. <laughs> and you know, you you, yeah. you 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 pronounced Renaissance very different, so you know you clearly know a lot. But in woodpeckers, right? Yeah. But how did you become the specialist now in, yeah. in non? Why that? I guess is what I'm saying. Well, Jack, because I'm an odd duck. <laughs> <laughs> Every I love all, it. All my friends would tell you, Joe. You know, I mean, I love sports. I was into sports and stuff. Uh, I, I, you know, I. Yeah. But uh, but I've always just uh, been uh, been uh, been curious. You know, I, you know, well, you know, I didn't even intend to go into the FBI. Um, they came and and, uh, and recruited me, and um, and so I end up in the FBI. I end up in Yuma, Arizona, working crimes on uh, Indian reservations for three years, doing homicides and so forth. And I assure you, uh, I wasn't focusing on uh, yeah. on, on nonverbals. But once I started working counterintelligence. Then the, 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 the drive was to, you know, how do we, we determine what they're, they're up to? And it just turned, it just happened that I had been in Yuma, Arizona when there was a kidnapping of a child. And um, these guys were so dumb, they just picked, <laughs> well, because they picked the first child they saw in this uh, kind of, you know, I don't want to say it was a ritzy neighborhood, but it was a neighborhood that had a golf course uh, there. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so they plucked this child off the street, not realizing that he actually comes from a poor neighborhood. He was just bicycling through here. So they they took him out to um, uh, to their hiding place. And this was a time before cell phones. And so they w w came into town, made a phone call to the child's mother. This is like a ransom? And for, for ransom, well, so we far. immediately yeah. got called. She was smart. She said, look, you know, my husband's not here. I don't ha handle any money. I, yeah. the, so th they called the FBI, and uh, we immediately jumped on it. And, um, and, uh, and it, actually, it was kind of interesting because how, how do you investigate a case like that? We, we flew in enough agents that we were within 30 seconds of every payphone in Yuma, Arizona, within three hours. We had enough agents on the ground to be within 30 seconds. We went to AT&T and we said, identify for us every payphone that you have. And we flew in enough agents so that we could be within 30 seconds. So the next time they came in, we were able to uh, observe them, and, uh, but we didn't know where the child was, and so we were observing them. And to make a long story short, on the th second call, their body language changed. Um, they were, there was more facial rubbing, um, there was a lot uh -huh. more pacing and, and so forth. And I was just a young agent, but I said to the the supervisor, I, I said, I, I think they're going to kill this child. Oh, no. Things have changed. Oh, no. And he looked at me like, well, what do you know? You, you've only got two years in the bureau. And I, and I said, well, that's just the impression I got. But he listened to me. We ended up taking them down. Uh, we found the child. We rescued him. Fortunately, he was being held by a, th a third person. But the word got out that um, I was pretty good with the body language. Okay. And, um, and so somewhere along the line, um, one day I, I get a, f a phone call and, um, and they said, uh, re report to Washington and um, don't tell anybody that, you know, what you're doing, just come up here. And, and that was it. And then I was involved in the behavioral program after that. Oh, no kidding. So I'll start from that one, that one case? Yeah. Okay. So what is so? What were some of the, you know, as you think back to. I was. I like to talk to about like breakthroughs or yeah. these times where it really be, where there something became clear, where there was this moment of clarity, whether it was, you know, five years in or twenty years in or or 
or where you just like, like something clicked? Is there, was there ever a moment like that where you just really became confident or really observed something unique that that was kind of a breakthrough for you? I I think it's it's kind of an odd breakthrough point. The the breakthrough point came um, after I had retired, and um, and somebody um, somebody had said, you know, you, you what's a good book on body language? And I said, you know, I've read almost every book that is out there on body language. And I said, I didn't like the way any of them taught it because body language <clears throat> is mostly written either from the psychologist standpoint, Paul Ekman, um, Judy Burgoon, Mark Frank, these uh, famous authors, or it's written from the anthropologist standpoint, David Givens, uh, Joe Coolis, uh, 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 other people. And I said, but nobody has brought it all together and taught it in a, or, or written about it in a way that's easy to understand. And I said, um, I'd like to write one in the way that I wish I had been taught body language, okay. which is to really simplify it because we humans are really very binary. We're either comfortable or uncomfortable. We're either confident or lacking confidence. And we reflect that uh, the minute we're born. And, uh, and we had to, it had to be simple. It had to be binary so that our species could, could take care of itself. And, uh, and so that's why I set out to, to write what everybody is saying as though I was teaching myself for the first time. And I think that was a breakthrough moment for me that I couldn't find what I wanted out there. And I think that's what's resonated with, um, with audiences because it, after 10 years, it's still the number one body language book in the world. It's the number one body language book in China. It's, you know, it, it, it was just something that was totally unexpected, but it was the absence of something like that mm -hmm. that, that really propelled me. That was, that what for me was a breakthrough. And, and to have the, the license, because at that point, I'd already been reading this stuff. I had already been keeping notebooks on body language for 25 years, 30 years. And I think it was at that point where, where it was, okay, now you're ready. Yeah. Now you're ready. I couldn't have done it 10 years right, earlier. Right, right. It, it came at the right point. It was the, the, the bringing together of now I have the confidence, the observations, the, uh, all that but it was sort of this license to take because nobody else had taken it. Got it, got it, very good. Question for you. You know, oftentimes we, you know, we're talking about this conference here and, and you know, we're trying to teach um, body language and we're trying to help people. Yeah. And oftentimes I think we teach it from an observational side. So meaning that I as a salesperson or I as a manager can, can yeah. you know, and I think a lot of this is probably an unconscious competence for some people. They can just kind of see what they're, when they're binary, yeah. they're either happy, they're not. Yeah. Right? And I'm sure there's things that, that, that tell that, you know, sure. and I'm not an expert at this, not even an amateur. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> this idea can, can, in your learning, did you learn how to, how to alter your own body language or how to be aware? Because I don't know that we're always aware. Yeah, at least I don't know yeah. that I am. No, I, I, I don't think that's a that's a fantastic question because I don't think most of the time we are aware. The only time we I think we're really aware is like if we go for a job interview and we're preening ourselves right. and right. and uh, you know making sure that our lips aren't too dry. But for the most part, uh, we don't really uh, think about that. But I th I. You know, I think the first time I did what it's called perception management was when I, you know, went out on my first case in, in the FBI and, and I thought to myself, okay, I got to look like an FBI agent. 
I, okay. I can't okay. I can't look like Joey from Miami. I gotta look, you know. I gotta look like uh-huh. Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> you know, with a with a trench coat. You get it right away. With a yeah. trench coat, with a nice uh, the nice suit, the nice tie, clean shoes, and so forth. And I and I think we all play these personas. Um, you know, you're elegantly dressed up. Uh, we 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 play different parts. And, and, um, and I don't think that's being phony in any way. I think uh, life requires us to play different parts. Yeah. And, uh, and it's fulfilling um, when a leader plays that, um, that part as, as, as you do. So I, I, think, I think we all play different roles at different stages uh, in, in, our, in our lives. And, uh, and I certainly, you know, if, if, if we're having fun with a group, uh, you know, you behave differently than when you're supposed to be the visiting scholar and, and, and so, so what's forth. The, what's the distinction here? Let me ask you a question because mm-hmm. I, what I hear you say is that, that you had the <laughs> self-awareness that you wanted to look like an FBI agent. Yeah. And what you're saying to me without is that I've got the self-awareness as, you know, here, kind of head of this organization right now, that I better look like I'm the head of this organization. I can't come in unshaven and, you know, kind of have a different posture and all yeah. that stuff, right? So I, I guess I, you do that, you know. I guess that's, that's kind of the case. Um, is that what you're, so th- what's the distinction between acting the part yeah. and, and, and not being phony or not being <laughs> fake, you know, because th- there, there's a, yeah. I, does that make sense? Oh yeah, of course it makes sense, and it's and it's a it's a profound question because um, we have all run into somebody who was being phony, who is trying to sell us a car, and is being too friendly. Right. When the situation doesn't call for that, or we haven't known each other long enough, um, I I think that there's there's people that do come across uh, 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 too phony. But I don't see, you know, Shakespeare was right. Life is theater. And I don't see any, re- I mean, I can tell you there were many times when I was on that uh, reservation and on the Parker Indian Reservation, and I was by myself. Backup was three hours away, and I was scared. I was scared. And I had to play like I wasn't scared. Now, is that being phony? I don't think so. I think I, I think this is what was required of me, yeah. and um, and I think we we have to look at, uh, for, for instance, whenever there's um, in any industry, any time a situation is dynamic, any time there is instability, any time there is complexity we gravitate to whoever presents as the most stable. That's good, that's good learning right there. And so we have to rise to that, even though we are confronted with the same complexity, we have to be that stable person to 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 say you know what everything's going to be all right and do you think that stability is is what i'm going to get from you now is that stability is not just what they say but it's how they look right it's how they it's their it's their bearance how they how they carry themselves in that in Absol- that time that I, right? I, you're exactly right the greatest example in history was winston churchill sure. for two years the nazis are plundering europe Everything that the Brits have tried has uh, come apart, and yet he stood there resilient, not once wavering in his intestinal fortitude, and that strengthened the resolve, even while he didn't know how they would win in the end because America hadn't been committed to the war yet. Right. But that's, that's why he was there. They needed someone. And interestingly enough, of the 38 million um, uh, people in the UK at the time, there was not one other person that any other uh, politician would have picked other than Winston Churchill mm-hmm. because he had been resolved in his, um, in, in his feelings towards uh, uh, Nazi Germany since the 30s. So I, he, was, he was playing a role. 
and, and, and it was an essential role, even though you could look at it and say, it was an empty suit. They they were running out of aircraft. Right, right. And yet they were getting bombed every night. Yeah. Bombed every night, running out of food, running out of fuel, and yet because in complexity someone has to be that stable uh, person. And I think that's the key to, to 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 leadership. It's not being perfect. Yeah. It's it's being what is needed at that moment to to. Uh, uh, marshal the uh, the resources. How do you, if you were to work one on one, if you were to coach me as an example, yeah. you know, I would say, Joe, help me with this. You know, I want to be that leader that people look to that says, yeah. you know, the Jack is that 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 aisle and that 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 center of stability when things are a little bit chaotic. What would you tell me? How would you start? Or, or is that a fair question? Well, it's a it's a difficult question because I've I've done this with uh, with individuals in in, in different uh, scenarios, and and the question is when there when there is instability, what's our default? Okay. Do we do we go into panic mode, or or do we or that great scene where uh, Ed Harris in uh, Apollo thirteen says, "Stay focused, work the problem." Mm-hmm. What's the problem? is a, a good leader immediately sizes up everything and rather than go into panic mode or reactive mode says let's break it down into its con- constituent mm-hmm. parts who what when where okay and now let's address each 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 one and that action alone which is cognitive helps people to say, okay, you know what? Let's let's settle down. Ralph, you do this. Sally, Jane, focus on that, and let's bring it together. Let's focus not on the why it happened, but what are we going to do now? And I, so yeah, I would have to, you know, I would have to ask you what happens in those crises uh, uh, points, um, because that's what often. Um, it's troubling for an executive when yeah. that day that you had planned is suddenly gone. Right. Yeah. Right. What I'm hearing though is is that that you, what, what was the quote you had from Shakespeare? It, uh, li- life is theater, and you, and you believe that to be true. And I, 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 I I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just yeah. No, I th- I think so because he was a great observer. Yeah. He was a great writer because he was a great observer. So there's the I guess what I'm what I'm what I'm getting to is is that when you do have a role in the business, yeah. a leader, you're a leader in the business. Yeah. You know, there is some element of of acting into that position. You know, you got to be yourself for sure. I'm not saying you, you're you're a phony, but there's there's a certain um, you can't be you can't be phony in the ways that people find offensive. I. You know, I, I just did an event the other day, and I made sure that I shook hands with all the stage hands, with mm-hmm. w- with everybody. And the person that was hosting me said, "Do you always do that?" And I go, "Yes." Why? I have to thank them. They made me look look yeah. good. That's just the that's just the way I am. I think if I was phony people would pick up on that. They would say, oh, yeah. he, th- this is just superficial. I, when you care about people, when you're empathetic, when you, when you, as a leader, like yourself, you exercise stewardship over an organization and the people that are directly right. under you, they will sense if, if you are not authentic. And, and even our body language, for instance, when somebody pats you on the back, uh, when, when it's a full palm or touching versus uh, when somebody doesn't mean it and they just do it with their fingertips and you recoil from that, it's because they don't mean it. Oh, okay. Because okay. when we like things, we press warmly against it. When we don't, we tend to touch with the fingertips. And and you can see uh, relationships coming apart when couples no longer uh, fully touch each other, but uh, are are touching each other with with fingertips. So I I, I think we have the the ability to to pick up on, on, on phoniness, 
but I see, I see the theater as being, this is my role. My ro if you're a security guard, my role is to keep this building safe. If I am the, the CEO, I am the steward over this organization, and I have to, uh, I have to play a role. And, and that role is I'm going to meet everybody. I'm going to get to know them mm -hmm. in time, and, um, and I'm going to establish communication with them. And, and maybe that's all I'll be able to do. But I, but I think that's part of the role. So I, I don't think that's, that's phony, no. No, I didn't mean it that way either, but I, no. I, I hear what you're saying though. Yeah, I mean, because there is, you know, there's, there's, you know, Jack as the CEO of Nexstar acts a little different than when Jack's by himself hunting at his cabin. I mean, I, I, sure. I have just kind of a, you know, I, I, I feel like I've got to put my game face on a little bit when I come to work. And it's not, it doesn't feel uncomfortable, but it's just different than what I do someplace else. Yeah. And I realize that people are observing me, right? I realize that, that when I walk into a room that people are consciously or, or subconsciously, they're, they're, they're casting judgment. They're just trying to understand, yeah. you know, what, it's the person of substance and meaning. You know, you just used an interesting word. I think we overuse the word judgment. I, I tend to get away from that word because I think we as a species we assess each other out of necessity. We're constantly assessing each other. Very good. And I think it was crucial for our survival. I think it remains crucial for us. And we are transmitting information. My mother doesn't dress me. I dress myself. I choose the haircut that I'm going to have. I choose to floss, to cut my nails, and so forth. This sends messages, and um, the things we attach to ourselves send messages, whether it's a BMW or a Volkswagen. It doesn't matter. Right. But these are messages, and we cannot ignore messages. All we can do is interpret them and, and, uh, and work with them. But I think people do expect different things from yourself. Um, look at Tim Cook at um, Apple. Yeah. At Apple, I've seen him uh, grow and change over the years, and um, you know, uh, he he's definitely different now uh, because he has the the burden yeah. of this massive uh, organization, and um, and I think our work also shapes us. That's that's so true. I love what you said there about assessing. Yeah. Cause, and, and what you said that is everything we do, whether you decide to wear nice clothes or you decide not to. Sure. You could say, well, if I'm wearing nice clothes, I'm, I'm sending out that I'm, I'm something. If I'm wearing ratty clothes, it's like I don't care. Or maybe, but you're still sending a message, right? You're still sending a, a, some, some example of yourself. Right, trying to send out to the world. You're you're exactly right. I when I got some advanced training, uh, Mark Mills, who's a forensic psychiatrist who trained me, said, you know, there's all these tests and inventories for assessing for depression. As soon as that person walks through the door, I can break it down for you by their posture because they're not bouncing, because their, their, their smile is limited, their eyelids are further down and, and, and all this stuff. The, the way they're dressed, um, they're, they're not fixing themselves up, they've let themselves go because mm -hmm. there's other priorities for that brain that is presently ill. And um, so we can assess a lot um, we can assess moods, we can uh, assess intentions and so forth. And what I tell people is, we're not making judgments. We are assessing what is the information out there. Now, it's our, it's our obligation, not, not yours, to then ask, is something wrong? Are you in a good mood? Right. What's, what's going on in your life and, and, and so forth? Um, and, um, and but that's our responsibility too. But our responsibility is to assess. I want to talk about one other thing here too. And you've been really, really helpful and very gracious here. Thank you. 
This has been, well, this has been fun. It's been kind of free ranging, but I like very free ranging. Yeah, we, we've I didn't know the waterfront. No, we didn't. We were just going to talk a little bit. But yeah. but this idea that that what I'm what I what I want to ask you is from your experience. So if mood, you, you mentioned depression. I don't want to talk about that because that's deep seated and yeah. Yeah, it's an illness. I know and, yeah. and it's very sensitive to it. But um, let's say that I'm not depressed, but I'm uh, I'm just a little off. Yeah. So I, I come in and, I, and I, I wake up that way and I just feel, just for some reason, I just feel a little bit off. Yeah. Um, and then I show that in my body language. Right. Um, one train of thought is, is that, well, I gotta get my head right and then my body will respond. Yeah. The question I have for you is, can I just start to respond as a happy person with my continence and my actions and put a smile on my face and will that then change what's inside by what I'm doing externally, this physiology thing. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And there is research that, um, that, uh, that shows that if, if a person is just a little down, right. okay, um, uh, you know, the, the, the one experiment where if you put a pencil in their mouth and they bite on it, um, it forces the same muscles as a smile. Um, and so they, they, they begin to feel a little better. Or if you just say, hey, while you're, while you're walking down the, the street, see if you can count how many birds are on the top, very top ledge of each building. And just the mere fact that they're looking upward changes their posture and it changes and it sends different chemicals right. um, through the body. Those kinds of things, um, you know, hearing a good joke and then you you crack up and all of a sudden right. that it lifts that. I think for the for the everyday kind of uh, yeah, it's you know it's the end of the week. I've had a, a rough week. Might be uh, useful, um, but for the clinically depressed. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, it's it's not that simple because right. we're really talking about um, th th there's just not enough um, serotonin I got it. yeah and so it's it's uh, yeah it's I definitely wanted different. to move that over to the side but I was just talking yeah. about just generally but the, you know I mean it's it's something that uh, as as a business because I have my own business I'm very sensitive uh, also to individuals that work for me. Uh, because I've had, uh, in, in one instance, where uh, a, a sort of gradual depression was, was setting in. And I, you know, it was one of those things where I, I'm glad I handled it by, by not saying something stupid like, are you depressed? But rather spending a little bit more time Mm -hmm. with the individual and just talking about things in general and then allowing them the access so that they could reveal that they were having a tough time. Um, I think oftentimes we make a mistake by being too direct and I think I think often enough is we, if we just give them that that access yeah. to, to, uh, to get them to, uh, to, to open up. Well, that was not where I wanted that to go, but that was good because I, I was thinking, you know, just just generally, the kind of that that not not the, a seriously depressed yeah. person or even a modestly depressed yeah. person. I get that, right? Yeah. But but just but the, the uh, just the the energy level. If I can, if yeah. I can. Well, here's a here's a uh, here's a very simple one that uh, I often do with with uh, with an audience. If uh, if I you know they they've been sitting in their seats for uh, three or four hours, and one of the easiest things to do is you say, all right, everybody, stand up, stand behind your chair and now we're going to inch up and stretch our bodies and we I count to three and uh, I'm the body language expert so please do this so do it a second time and now we do it a third time and then I, I have them seated and uh, uh, and then I go do you want to know why I had you do that and uh, they, yeah I said because I was in charge <laughs> And then they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that lights the mood. That and that lights, lights yeah. the mood. If I had come in and said, hey, I, I want you all to laugh and, and lighten the mood, uh, that's not right. going to work. I'm right. not a joke teller. But all of a sudden, now they're laughing at, 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 
at the silliness of um, of 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 what they, uh, they've done. So there's there's things that uh, yeah there's things that we can do. Good, good, <laughs> absolutely. Well, yeah. I sure have enjoyed our conversation. It was, it's just been a conversation too. This has definitely been one that we've covered the waterfront here, right? <laughs> a lot of different things, and I sure appreciate. Uh, you coming here and sharing some of your background, some of your journey here, and uh, congratulations on all you've accomplished. Well, thank you, you Jack, and, uh, and and thank you because uh, you're you're a great guy, uh, great organization, thank and you. uh, your curiosity is uh, is really what uh, I admire the most. Well, thank you a lot. Thank you very much. And you know, I look forward. We haven't heard you talk yet, so normally I do these podcasts. If I do them with a guest like yourself, I have heard. Their, their, their deal for a couple, three hours, which helps me with these. So I kind of walked in a little colder than I normally do. So I might, but I, I know what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, oh, if you're done, I should have said this. I should have asked that. So, well, that'll be okay, yeah, though. It'll be fun. Yeah. So what, if people want to know more about mm-hmm. your work, tell them what's the, what's the first thing they should do. Yeah, uh, my books are available at most bookstores. Uh, visit your local bookstore. All of my books Joe are... Joe uh, Navarro, yeah. okay. Right, at, uh, on Amazon. Or they can go to my uh, website at uh, uh, joenavarro.net, and, uh, and they can find uh, stuff about me and things that... Uh, that uh, you've, you've gotten more little secrets out of me than, <laughs> <laughs> than I've ever revealed. So that uh, kudos to, to you. Well, thank you. It's been fun. And thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, my pleasure. And thank you all for listening. This is very different for Jack Tester, at least, Leadership <laughs> Lounge. I've sure enjoyed it. I'm here with Joe Navarro in Seattle, Washington, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks so very much.